Dann müsstest du mich jetzt groß schalten, oder? Um, okay, I think we're going to start. Um, hello, everyone, and uh, a very warm welcome to the Leibniz Institute for Research on Society and Space. I'm Matthias Bernd. Uh, I'm working here as a senior researcher and as uh, the acting head of the department Regeneration of Cities, and I will moderate the discussion today. Uh, this is the 16th uh, IRS International Lecture on Society and Space, this time co-organized with the Humboldt University of Berlin. Um, and we will talk about arrival cities and neighborhood traps. And our main speaker is Douglas Young. Um, Douglas Saunders, I'm so sorry. That shouldn't have happened. <laughs> But Douglas Young is from Toronto. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Um, so our main speaker is of course Doug Saunders. And we have also invited Nihat El Kayet, uh, who will act as a discussant here. Um, I must say this is one of the most visited events that we ever had here at the Institute. And I think the major reason for this is of course, that we have Doug Saunders as a speaker. So um, obviously most of you would have heard of Doug, um, so it, that it might appear like carrying codes to Newcastle to uh, speak a lot about uh, the credentials of Doug. Uh, nevertheless, I would like to say a few words and introduce him very briefly. Uh, Doug is a Canadian author, journalist and consultant who has specialized in issues of city, migration, population, and policy. He is the international affairs columnist um, for the Canadian national newspaper, The Globe and Mail, and has served for decades as the paper's European bureau chief and its LA bureau chief as well. Um, Doug has been extremely influential with his publications uh, and has won uh, the National Newspaper Award, um, which is Canada's counterpart for the Pul Pulitzer Prize on five occasions. Uh, his most renowned book, and I think uh, this is also most likely why most of you joined this event, uh, is Arrival Cities, How the Largest Mismigration in History is Reshaping Our World, uh, which has been published in 2011, uh, which visits uh, 20 cities and five continents to analyze the factors that make immigration settlement neighborhoods or arrival cities into successes or failures. Um, This book has not only been widely read and well received, but it's also been widely discussed among planners and decision makers, not only in Canada and the US, but also increasingly in Germany, uh, and become something of a blueprint for urban development discussion and strategies, I think, worldwide. Um, Doug is currently uh, residing in Berlin as a Richard von We Richard von Weizsäcker Fellow at the Robert Bosch Academy. Uh, where he's researching neighborhood level inequality and social mobility in European cities. Uh, thanks, Doug, for joining us in, and thanks for coming. Um, as I already said, we have collaborated with uh, Humboldt University, especially um, with the Berlin Institute for Integration and Migration Research. So our second speaker is Nihat El Kayet. Um, let me say a few words about Nihat as well. Uh, Nihad is a German sociologist. She wrote her PhD uh, on local conditions of democracy, the re relevance of neighborhoods for first and second generation immigrants. Uh, and I'm glad to say that this uh, PhD thesis is not only a brilliant piece on itself, but it also won the junior award of the Session for Urban and Regional Sociology of the German Sociologists Association since 2015. Is that correct? Uh, Nihat works as a research mm -hmm. associate at the Department of Social Sciences uh, of Humboldt University and the Berlin Institute for uh, Integration and Migration Research. She is a principal investigator in research projects, in two research projects. One is called Welcoming Neighborhoods, Conditions for Social Cohesion in Super Diverse Communities, and one from Demolition to Immigration, New Perspective for Peripheral Estates. And by the way, this is also how we two met Uh, because we collaborate in this project. So I feel very honored and privileged to have both Doug and Nihat as our guests today at Erkner. Uh, very, thank you very much for accepting our invitation. Um, a few words on the hardware of this event and technical procedures. Uh, we, pro we will proceed uh, the following way. First, uh, Doug will speak about 45 minutes and will give us a lecture. 
uh, then we will give the floor to Lihat, who will uh, provide a few few thoughts and comments on uh, Doug's ideas. The way you can all can join in is the following. All participants will be muted and all cameras will be switched off during the session so that we can focus on the lecture. Um, however, you can ask your questions using the chat function, um, which I will coordinate. So basically when you send in the question, I will get it in the chat group um, and I will collect the questions, uh, summarize and moderate and um, bring them up in the Q&A part. Um, and the last thing I want to say is that this webinar will be recorded. So you can, and we will upload it on our webpage, so you can still see it a second or a third time, send it to your colleagues and friends, um, and please feel free to do so. So without further ado, I would hand over the word to Doug. Um, Doug, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Matthias, uh, both for that generous in, in, uh, introduction and and for op inviting me here to Erkner on the on the uh, eastern outskirts of of Berlin uh, to give this lecture. And I should say both Matthias Berndt and uh, Nihad Al Qaeda, my interlocutors, have have produced work that uh, informed me greatly in in this research that I'm doing now. And also thanks to uh, uh, Sarah Breckman beside me here uh, from IRS Erkner, who is uh, who is managing the complex technical uh, work on, on this lecture. Um, I should start by saying this is, this is a really crucial, I think, historical moment during which to be discussing uh, the phenomena that are happening in neighborhoods uh, that are often thought to be national or uh, international in, in, in nature. Um, it's evident that a growing number, to a growing number of people today that uh, the momentous events of this year are playing out not at the level of countries or even states and regions, even if they're international events, uh, uh, but in specific neighborhoods more than any others. Um, let me, we're, we're living in an era of large scale phenomena that are the responsibility of national governments and international organizations but which manifest themselves mainly or principally at the municipal or neighborhood level. And we have a lot of crises uh, slowly unfolding in our time, but caused by the fact that the places where crises of migration, of poverty, of, uh, uh, of, of, of diseases, of segregation and so on, are matters of national policy but are, are manifestations at the local levels where there either aren't governments uh, with responsibilities or resources to deal with them, or those that are there do not possess the authority or resources to deal with them. So let me start with, with one example that's, that's unfolding before us right now, which is the COVID-19 uh, crisis. Um, So let's take a look at how COVID-19 is developing. I think initially we thought of it as being um, something that spread from countries to countries or from cities to cities, but increasingly we're recognizing that it is a disease of specific neighborhoods. Um, here are three cities, New York City, Toronto, and Paris, uh, picked largely at random, but because they're three cities that happen to have statistics on the disease down to the neighborhood level. And in all of those, and in a great many other Western cities that I can, I can identify, uh, the disease is mainly manifesting itself now as a disease of the suburbs, and particularly the inner apartment uh, suburbs. In New York City was hit extremely hard, but Manhattan was, was all but spared. It was the uh, apartment suburbs of, of Queens and Brooklyn, uh, uh, Queens and, and Bronx and further out that, that were hit. Toronto, my, my hometown, it was a disease of, it and still is a disease of the Eastern and Western uh, Northern apartment suburbs and, and same in Paris. Um, these are, it is a disease of increasingly of rural areas, but, as, but to the extent that it's a disease of cities, it's a disease of the urban inner periphery. Now, let's look at a set of other phenomena uh, which, which affects cities. Um, 
those same neighborhoods that are being hit by COVID-19 heavily are also the places that are the predominant destinations today for new immigrants. They are places of low income, not of the, not of the most uh, deepest intergenerational poverty. They're not abject neighborhoods, but they're places of low employed income. And they tend to be the neighborhoods with the highest proportions of racial minorities uh, as however defined within those, within those cities. Um, these are not the neighborhoods where immigration took place or where low incomes were found predominantly necessarily a generation ago in all these cities. Both immigration settlement and poverty, uh, however, have tended to shift in cities across the Western world with some exceptions from the core the, to the urban center to the urban periphery. What, what, what I often describe as the, the suburbanization of immigration settlement and the suburbanization of poverty. Uh, and it's, this is caused by changing housing markets, changing labor markets, changing patterns of urban policy uh, that have turned these places into settlement neighborhoods. And another thing that unites these neighborhoods, and this is the, the topic of, of my lecture today, is a third aspect, um, which is socioeconomic mobility. Broadly speaking, uh, the chances of doing better than your parents did, upward socioeconomic mobility, is something that is becoming increasingly con uh, concentrated at the neighborhood level. So what we see here is a small section of a, of a map of the United States uh, drawn by the economists uh, Raj Chetty and Nathaniel Hendren, who merged the census and income tax return data for tens of millions of people in order to be able to determine the level of intergenerational income mobility down to the neighborhood level and often to the street level across the United States. And what this shows, uh, this little slice of Washington, D.C., it shows each street by the odds that you will make more money than your parents, essentially, um, with red being very low probability of making more money than your parents, uh, and blue being a very high probability uh, of doing so. And in countries and cities where that have been able to do this sort of statistical analysis, uh, we, we're finding that there's an increasing degree of, uh, of, of concentration of low socioeconomic mobility, so inability to move up the, uh, the income ladder uh, concentrated by neighborhood and very often concentrated in these neighborhoods that I've just uh, uh, identified. Um, so social, uh, um, a, a lot of poverty in North America and Europe has traditionally, certainly for the last 50 years, has been what you might call transitional poverty. It's uh, low income or being put below the poverty line is a period that you pass through uh, during your life course or during your family's uh, multi-generational pathway, particularly for people from a migration background. Um, it, pov poverty, not for everybody, but for a lot of groups and a lot of neighborhoods was something people passed through. But what we're seeing uh, increasingly is that pathways into the lower bounds of the middle class are, are becoming less available in a lot of neighborhoods. Um, I, 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 I rather glibly call some of these neighborhoods trap districts, which is not how anybody who would live in them uh, would identify them. Uh, very often they're places that people are, are proud to live in and have, a, and have an enjoyable standard of living. But in part, in part that's because the people seeking a better life are, have been able to leave these neighborhoods uh, and so on. Um, when I talk about the lower bounds of the middle class, I don't mean some bourgeois lifestyle. I mean, I mean the basic functional definition of the middle class as the ability to uh, have sustainable tenure on your housing, borrow money, save money, uh, put your children into post-secondary education and have enough both social capital and real capital that you're not in danger at any point in your lifetime of slipping into poverty. So having a sustainable uh, livelihood uh, 
uh, and, and, and some ability to control your destiny, start a business, uh, 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 switch jobs, and, and so on. That lower bound of the middle class has become increasingly inaccessible in a lot of geographies. We know this both statistically and analytically, and also uh, uh, from, from analysis, uh, from, from my own research and examination. Why does this matter? Um, in a lot of countries, we do not have the ability to analyze socioeconomic mobility in this way, but we do have the ability to look at inequality. Um, and we do know that, uh, that we're seeing a lot more uh, income and, and economic segregation by neighborhood in most Western countries. And in fact, a lot of, uh, uh, in most countries of transition economies. We're talking largely about Europe and North America today because that's the focus of my research. But the phenomena we're talking about, uh, the neighborhood level concentration of low socioeconomic mobility is very much a phenomenon in middle income countries in China and Turkey and Brazil uh, and so on. And uh, in fact, I think you could argue, argue that a lot of the political crises and tensions uh, in middle income countries today in the so-called BRICS countries uh, are traceable to specific neighborhoods where people expected uh, a trajectory in their lives, uh, a move from their, from their status, from, from uh, worker dormitory housing into, into privately owned housing, from, uh, from a low income job to a slightly better income job, that never materialized. Um, and in Western cities, we're seeing this as well. So you look at a chart like this, this is a, 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 a type of chart known as the Great Gatsby Curve, which shows that, that countries with uh, high degrees of inequality um, also tend to have high degrees of, of low social mobility. So you could say that social mobility is the dynamic aspect of inequality. It's the ability to shift from the, lo from the lower quarter of income to the middle quarter. Um, and, and countries vary in this, um, um, but, uh, but generally speaking, uh, the, the, an increase in inequality, which we're seeing in a number of countries, corresponds to an increase, uh, uh, an increase in low levels of social mobility. Um, and we can see that resulting in uh, constricted pathways to the middle class and often in a shrinking middle class. So we look at this chart and analysis of changes in the size of the middle class. Um, here in Germany, we saw the, the most dramatic decrease in the size of the, or the share of people who were in, in middle class, in, in middle incomes. Uh, of any European country between 2004 and 2014, I suspect in large part because of changes to uh, uh, social programs, uh, there was an almost 10% decline in the size of the middle class. And other analyses have shown that that's not caused by people um, increasing their incomes to, to upper class incomes, but more predominantly because of, uh, of, of a decline uh, falling to the lower, uh, lower quarter. In other words, to a lack, of, a lack of pathways to move up from lower incomes to, to middle incomes. And, and as you can see, a majority of countries have experienced this. So rather than looking at it as being a middle class shrinking, it's often more useful to look at it as, uh, as, as a pathway into the middle class becoming more constricted and looking for the places where this is occurring. So let's step back. Uh, as Matthias mentioned, uh, 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 about a decade ago, I published a book called Arrival City, which looked at the neighborhoods where immigrants first settle in about a dozen countries uh, and tried to develop a set of principles as to what makes these immigrant settlement neighborhoods into successful places that, uh, that, uh, that, that create a new middle class or, or failed places that lead to intergenerational poverty, what, what factors can move in, in between, uh, can cause them to shift from one place to the other. Um, the arrival city, as I defined it, is, is, is a city within a city. It's, it's a geographic area, um, hard to define analytically, but well known to, to its occupants and participants in which 
newcomer communities from the same place of origin form networks of mutual support and internal economies uh, linking them both to the established economy of the city back to their originating village. Immigration, uh, including most forms of asylum, is a calculated gamble on behalf of its participants. It is, it, it is almost non-existent for people to immigrate internationally because they've fallen into destitution and they're fleeing. It tends to be reasonably well-informed and well-invested people uh, making a calculated move based on knowledge which may or may not be accurate or, or, or it may or may not be mythology, mythological, but on knowledge of known opportunities in a place tending to rely on, uh, on the support of people in their proximity. Um, this particular rival city district in that photo is in Antwerp uh, and, uh, and is fairly typical of the old school urban districts in the center of cities that, uh, that a generation ago were immigration settlement districts that developed their internal economies that, that, uh, that sent children and grandchildren on through education and, and, uh, and served as springboards, often using small business and uh, linkages into the, into the surrounding uh, established economy uh, to do this. So the ideal of the arrival city um, is as a, a, is as a set of linkages. Every, every immigrant has an imaginary dotted line that leads from the, neighbor, the neighborhood or the village that they came from in the, in the country they, they originated through the, the arrival district, through, through the district of initial settlement into some imagined place in the established economy and education system and social system of the city. And the arrival city neighborhood serves as a, a linkage between these things. An idea of where you, what, what you want, where you want your children to end up both physically and in terms of educational and socioeconomic status, um, often vague and difficult to articulate, uh, but enough to motiv motivate those initial risks when I mentioned. When it works right, uh, settlement neighborhoods can serve as a platform for upward mobility, um, and establishes link, these links into the, into, into the city. Um, and it, uh, again, and we're, this isn't really part of our discussion today, but these neighborhoods also serve as principal vehicles for support of the sending villages and neighborhoods in the lower income country. The, the predominant source of foreign investment in less developed countries today is remittances sent back from, from immigrant neighborhoods in, in Western countries. Um, and those back and forth links remain over long periods. Now, there is no, almost no uh, urban neighborhoods that are strictly just arrival city districts for immigrants. Um, usually they tend to be low income districts that are also shared with other domestic populations. Um, very often uh, post industrial populations or current industrial working class uh, populations, um, sometimes in particular in this part of the world, post-socialist populations um, who who were residing there uh, at a period when it was when the neighborhood was state housing, um, and who are going on their own trajectory uh, from the previous economic situation of themselves and their parents and grandparents into a new economy, and it's often it's often good to understand these non-migrant populations of uh, peripheral urban districts, of, these, of, of towns, of, 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 of regions, as being something like immigrants themselves, as being people who are attempting an integration from a previous economic reality into, an, into a new economic sphere. And indeed, often, um, the best analytical frame to put on these non-migrant populations in these low-income or low-cost housing districts is to understand them as, as people attempting to integrate um, and often in need of the same sort of resources and support, but not coming into the process often with the same social capital or the same uh, desire to risk and, and, and achieve social mobility that the migrant populations did. So very often these, uh, these neighborhoods uh, uh, are places where the low social mobility is being experienced differently by different populations within them. And you see tensions within these 
uh, within these pop populations. Um, so some of the, some of the, a lot of the places that I'm studying tend to be mass housing districts in, in Europe like these, although I've also done work in dormitory cities in southern China, um, in uh, 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 suburbs of Cleveland where African American populations have, have uh, uh, changing relationships of ownership of housing and that sort of thing. Um, and and there are, there's, uh, it's also worth studying satellite cities that had been industrial cities and now serve as, uh, now serve as cities serving, producing circular migration into the larger city that surrounds them, post-industrial towns and, and some other re regions. But often, uh, often there are places that were built with, um, with an industrial population in mind, um, often an industrial population who use automobiles for transportation, um, and uh, uh, that became during a later generation or some, in some cases almost as soon as they were built, places that are initial settlement districts for immigrants, for, for asylum seekers and so on. Um, so some places like the, the neighborhood in Leipzig on the top left uh, were, were built as, as socialist mass housing, then became industrial mass housing. Um, and, and then after a period of semi-abandonment, uh, the migration crisis of 2015, 2016 brought in new populations who had their own trajectories and interests that put them at tension with existing populations there. Um, often, often in these neighborhoods, physical mobility is a, is a problem as, uh, as uh, linked to social mobility. Um, Almost nobody li strictly lives in a residential neighborhood and, and use it as a, as, uses it as the only part of the city they, they engage with. Often employment and, and, and other aspects of life take place in different parts of the city, but limited transportation connections, the need to uh, pack yourself onto a bus or a tram for half an hour or more uh, limits life to these places. Uh, often the the forms of economic segregation are related to forms of physical separation. Apartment suburbs tend to have a low overall population density, even though the individual buildings can be quite crowded inside and their elevators and so on. Um, and this low population density often looked good on the architectural renderings when these, and the urban planning renderings when these places were built, big empty green spaces between buildings and so on. But they become, um, those empty spaces become a forbidding form of, uh, of social isolation and a particularly gendered form of social isolation. It's often women from migration communities who find that the empty space between buildings becomes a, a forbidding and frightening place uh, that causes you not to want to leave the building and engage with other people and, and with the economy and creates forms of isolation that, that limit socioeconomic progress um, in these areas. Um, so we have a, a, a history of previous one. We have a, we, we, during the last 10 years and particularly during the last five or six years, there's been a real revolution in uh, academic understanding of local manifestations of, of, of social mobi socioeconomic mobility. Um, I alluded uh, earlier to this new economic practice that maps uh, socioeconomic mobility down to the neighborhood level. And this has become increasingly popular in, in a number of places. Uh, the United States, um, in, 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 in Canada, uh, Miles Korak, the economist, did a large scale analysis where he merged the census, re, re, census data and the income tax returns for tens of millions of people. And uh, uh, my team at, 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 and his produced the, this map of Canada that can examine the specific odds of socioeconomic mobility in, in microgeographies. And it's been done in, in Germany, Sweden, and, and a few other places. What's interesting about this form of economic analysis is that it charts each child's success uh, 
based on the neighborhood they came from, regardless where they end up living afterwards. Um, so it, it, it measures each person when they were perhaps 10 years old in the neighborhood, uh, compares the, and then compares their income at age 40, wherever they're living, with their parents' income at age 40 back in their old neighborhood. And what this means is that this form of analysis charts socioeconomic mobility uh, regardless of whether you continue living in the same place. And this has some important repercussions, both in terms of how this is analyzed and in terms of the policy responses uh, to neighborhood level socioeconomic mobility. Um, because a neighborhood that has increasing poverty and unemployment can appear to have very high positive upward socioeconomic mobility if a lot of the population are able to get out of the neighborhood, get on the highway nearby and go to university and that sort of thing. So here in Germany, it's not possible to produce uh, a map like this very accurately, except in the limited way that you see here, uh, very, in other words, very coarsely grained because uh, of data privacy laws and because it's a federal country and, and each of the 16 states charts this uh, data differently. But if you had been able to do an analysis such as Miles Korak did or Raj Chetty did in the United States, you'd probably find that um, uh, the experience of German reunification was an experience of very positive socioeconomic mobility. So if you had a map like this, uh, both the Canada and US maps on this chart, chart the parents' income in the mid 1980s and the children's income in, the, in around 2010, so when they're both around 40. Um, if you did that with, with say, say Rostock or, 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 or some other city in, in, in the former DDR, you would probably find that those cities would be very green. They would, they would show very high levels of positive socioeconomic uh, mobility because it, in the case of Rostock, a third of the, of the female uh, educated population left between 1990 and, and 2000 for the West uh, and experienced it. So you're measuring the, if you're measuring the people, uh, a place can appear to have very positive socioeconomic mobility, even if the place itself is experiencing increasing poverty and unemployment and other forms of, of deprivation. And policy outcome from this in the United States, um, but not in any other countries, has been to conclude from this that, uh, that the policy response should be to encourage people to move. And we'll talk about this a little bit uh, in, in a few moments, uh, uh, whether, 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 the res whether mobility should mean moving people or whether it should mean changing neighborhoods. But there's been a lot of other scholarship that's focused in recent years on neighborhood level uh, immobility that takes different approaches. Um, in sociologists uh, look at soci uh, look at uh, look at this as as a question of what institutions and resources exist in a specific geography. In the United States, starting in the 1980s, there was uh, the emergence of what's known as neighborhood effects sociology, which which examines. Uh, it examines a neighborhood as being sort of a built-in machine that produces levels of levels of social social mobility, and in fact, neighborhoods affect sociology gave rise to those economic maps that we saw, and then to a set of policies that followed. Urban geographers um, look look at opportunity structures within a particular neighborhood um, that produce inequality. Um, people who look at life course uh, analyses. Look at, uh, look at look at obstacles to trajectories through poverty into middle income during a life. Uh, look at phases in life that are interrupted by lack of resources in a specific geographic area. And of course, the economists who produced these maps, um, one of the conclusions of Raj Chetty and Nathaniel Hendren in the United States was that a certain level of socioeconomic mobility is baked into a specific neighborhood. Um, which is to say that 
in their view, regardless what's done, uh, that level of mobility is there. If you move a child from a neighborhood of low socioeconomic mobility to a neighborhood of high socioeconomic mobility before they're in their late teens, that, that, fa that family will then experience the new level of socioeconomic mobility in that neighborhood. And there have been a lot of natural experiments in the United States, like Hurricane Katrina, and like um, a whole set of policies that are known as moving to opportunity, where people are subsidized to move out of their low mobility neighborhood into a higher mobility one uh, and have generally seen that the families that move out during natural disasters or doing housing project reconstructions experience the level of mobility of their new neighborhood, regardless of what other, whatever other factors, regardless of education of parents or that sort of thing. So that's led to um, a, a set of conclusions which in the US, which say we should have more programs to encourage people to move. But there are a lot of other things that other scholars have identified as being factors within a neighborhood that produce low socioeconomic mobility. Um, uh, lack of pathways to the middle class within the neighborhood, lack of forms of house, housing that causes people that causes people to want to move out. We'll talk about that in a bit. Lack of post-secondary education options, uh, proxy network effects where a lot of families who, who do not have ambitions to do better influence other people around them. That's a popular area of study. Physical isolation, distance and transportation, lack of a surrounding economies to allow small business success and, and, and to create employment for people who live there. So if you focus on what's called a population-based approach, which is the, the US approach I've mentioned where you subsidize people's ability to move out of the neighborhood, you tend to emphasize something that happens in arrival city districts, that happens in, in immigration settlement districts anyway, which, which, which is a form of spiral where um, if, an, if there's no pathway into the lower bounds of the middle class within a residential neighborhood, um, the people who are seeking a better living will either move out or will move their children out and use various strategies that, that, that families know to get their children to schools in an established middle class district. And this causes a spiral where uh, the immigrants in the immigrant district who have ambitions either move out or move their, move their children out. The so-called white population uh, either through racial intolerance or through simple desire for mobility, move their families out or at least send their kids to different schools. This causes the schools to decline in quality. Uh, the more um, ambitious teachers to shift out of those schools into other neighborhoods, even in cities where this is not officially possible, teachers all have strategies for doing this. And it causes a downward cycle that's very hard to stop. And I've observed this in uh, neighborhoods of immigration settlement in a dozen countries where the neighbor, the neighborhood causes a spiral because the people seeking the, uh, the basic rungs on the ladder of uh, middle class accession, a, a, a better school, uh, a house that they, that has more space or that they can have some more sustainable form of tenure or ownership on, they seek it in another neighborhood and, and it causes a downward spiral. And, um, um, population-based approaches tend to emphasize that spiral, and uh, and the problem with the problem with those approaches, which are understandable in some ways, is that they don't solve the problem of the neighborhood. Um, they do rescue populations unless you actually demolish the residential neighborhood that is experiencing this spiral, or you have very dramatic uh, interventions into that neighborhood. Um, the population-based approach doesn't solve the problem, the problem of, this, of this spiral. And, uh, and you're going to need to deal with the neighborhood anyway, uh, particularly if, if you're leaving only the families that, have, uh, that are fairly lacking in social capital, that are, that, are, that are very dependent on benefits, that are often traumatized or, or have various things that produce an, an, an inability, or in some cases just are not interested in a different livelihood than they have. But when the neighborhood is experiencing this spiral, that stops being sort of a static contentment with your status and starts becoming part of a problem. So what do you do? Um, we, there, 
there, there's a whole history of urban reform and urban revitalization programs that have uh, that have either not solved these sort of problems or have produced perverse consequences. Um, we need to watch out for the perverse consequences of these things. I mentioned one, which is that if you try to solve the problem by helping families uh, achieve middle class accession by, uh, uh, by producing incentives for them to move to more successful neighborhoods, you are, you are going to have a perverse incentive within the old neighborhood that causes this downward spiral. There's, there's an opposite, opposite set of perverse incentives um, where, uh, where you attempt to revitalize uh, an immigration settlement neighborhood or, or a low income neighborhood by adding a middle class to it, by, putting, put, by plonking a bunch of housing in that is uh, uh, available for, for purchase by middle class community. Um, that can produce sort of a, a, a gentrification spiral where you're, where you're turning a low income immigration settlement neighborhood and uh, 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 an arrival city neighborhood into a middle class neighborhood that's, that's inaccessible to people. Now, this is not always the case. Um, I, I've, th there have been a number of instances where actually governments have set out trying to do this. Um, in the Netherlands, in, the Netherlands in, 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 in particular, um, no, can you go back to yeah. in, in, in the Netherlands in particular, it's generally the, been the, the principle of the housing corporation, housing corporations there during the last uh, 15 or 20 years or so to revitalize their buildings and increase the population density of neighborhoods because these neighborhoods often suffer from, these apartment neighborhoods often suffer from, as I said, low over, overall population density, which creates real problems for economic progress to increase the population density by making two thirds of the apartments they build uh, purchase apartments that cost a few hundred thousand euro uh, with the assumption being that they would bring the uppies in, they would bring an existing middle-class population in to invest in the neighborhood. And what's been interesting in a lot of those projects such as in, in, in Western Amsterdam is that they've been surprised that it's not the established, the, it's not the gentry who move in, but it is, uh, it is people of immigration background from the Moroccan and Turkish uh, migration communities in those neighborhoods who've made a little bit of money uh, or saved a little bit of money or, or, or so on, who are purchasing those apartments because they wanted to move to a neighborhood where they can own housing uh, and have seized the opportunity to do it within their own neighborhood. So um, sometimes creating a housing pathway within a neighborhood uh, can do it. Forms of housing tenure often can shape the, uh, the, the socioeconomic mobility picture of a neighborhood dramatically. Um, in the United States, you had a form of strictly ownership based housing uh, based on very risky mortgages tied to assumptions of income increase that caused a sudden shift to negative socioeconomic mobility after 2008, when particularly African-American communities uh, lost ownership of their housing and were shifted into forms of rental tenure or forms of personal bankruptcy. Um, on the flip side of the coin, uh, Matthias Berndt across the table from me has done a lot of work on, on mass housing districts here in former uh, uh, DDR in Germany, where the housing shifted very dramatically uh, right after 1990 from being uh, state housing to being mass privately owned housing, but a particular system after the, the uh, Hartz reforms in the early 2000s, which caused the rent to be paid not by the tenants, but be paid directly from the welfare agency to the landlord, so that it is de facto state housing, but it's privately owned. Um, which removes any ability of the residents to in, invest in their housing or to, to, to produce incentives for the owners of their housing to upgrade. They cannot use the, the payment as a form of community investment. So you need to create forms of, of value capture or participation. You could say that most immigrants want to be gentrifiers. Uh, the general desire of people who immigrate is to is to rise, is 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 to use uh, social housing or rental housing as a stepping stone to some form of tenure that's more sustainable, um, and 
in a lot of places, in particularly in English speaking countries and, and Belgium and places like that, most immigrants are more, are the, most gentrification is done by immigrants themselves. Somewhat here in Berlin as well, you see, you see a lot of the strategies used by immigrant communities to escape low income are through housing investment or this, a decision to purchase a building or something like that. Anyway, this grid, um, is something we produced in a, a project with the World Bank where we, where we looked at obstacles to social mobility within immigrant set, set, immigration settlement neighborhoods, although I should say this also applies to, to post-industrial neighborhoods and other forms of, uh, of urban marginal neighborhoods. Um, the resources that people need to achieve social mobility or the lack of those things would be the obstacles that often can be fixed by one-time interventions. Now, some of these things are things that, that only national governments can deal with. Pathway to full legal citizenship, um, uh, inclusive hiring often, things like that. But many of them are things that manifest themselves within the neighborhood itself and can be done with interventions in these things. Um, the ability to invest in a community could be seen either as 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 national policy, but it can also be seen as as the presence of specific institutions and buildings uh, within. Um, the the two big things within uh, urban neighborhoods that most block social mobility are physical transportation and schools. Um, We've seen during the COVID crisis that it is these neighborhoods that I showed at the map at the beginning of this presentation uh, that are suffering the most COVID. That's not just because they tend to be apartment buildings that are fairly crowded. In fact, it doesn't seem that's very much the situation. It's because the, the communities there who offer an immigration uh, communities or racial minority communities are the people most often uh, considered essential services workers who are required to go to work uh, in a hospital or in, or in whatever, they, a cleaner or what, whatever they do. And very often on very crowded forms of public transportation, such as buses or trams, um, poor transportation linkages are often the cause of the low uh, housing prices within these neighborhoods. I've often said, what makes a neighborhood an arrival city district that is whatever what makes it have a lower than average housing price is what will make it later fail as an arrival city district because whatever makes the housing price or rent low is a thing that will later, uh, it, it means that the next rungs on the income ladder are often missing in that neighborhood. Uh, transportation and schools, often the only interventions that really work well in turning around a neighborhood are ones where you replace a school, a school that's subject to that downward spiral I mentioned with something that is well above the level of schools in other places so that it becomes a school that attracts students from more middle class neighborhoods into the low income neighborhood uh, as a magnet. Only that I've seen really reverses that spiral. Anyway, um, there, we, we could have a whole other discussion of examples of uh, urban residential neighborhoods and, and urban immigration settlement neighborhoods that have managed to reverse that, that, those downward spirals and remove obstacles to upward social mobility. Um, uh, but that's, that's a whole other discussion. There are good examples of people doing other things. And the places that have done it have generally understood it from the perspective of the people who live there that have some participation of the community and its residents in uh, this transportation. And understanding, as I mentioned, that the people who live in the neighborhood have an imaginary dotted line that goes from the place they came from to a place where they imagine their children being. And often they're very willing and able to identify the specific obstacles within their neighborhood, in the connections between their neighborhood and other neighborhoods that block that, uh, that ambition. And often they're things that that planners and, and, and officials do not expect that are much simpler than you'd expect. Often the pathway is literally a physical pathway uh, or something like that. Uh, um, and as, as we've seen during the crises that have unfolded this year, the, the, the COVID crisis, the, the awakening of understanding of racial segregation within, within neighborhoods, that the, a, a one-time investment in clearing those pathways to mobility can produce benefits and, and, and can, can remove injustices and crises that plague entire countries by looking at the neighborhood level. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Doug. Um, 
Now it's, I think, Nihat's turn as a discussant, but in the meanwhile, I would like to remind everyone to use uh, his or her chat function uh, to send in questions. Uh, please, Nihat, the floor is yours. All right, thank you. Um, thank you for this fascinating talk, talk. and I think uh, especially although the question if and in what ways residential places form social inequality is a long-standing topic in social research, I think your talk is really helpful to have a fresh look at some of the questions we often think we know so well and I saw a lot of people that, um, that focus on these questions um, participating here um, and um, I think I, I especially like the focus on mobility, residential and social mobility, because I think most of urban, urban research often still research, researches people as staying put in neighborhoods, not really looking at who's moving out, moving to where, in what um, stage of the, of the life course. And in the following few minutes, I would like to add some, ex add some examples to your talk from uh, my and our own research, um, which uh, partly to get, uh, conducted together with Matthias and also then derive some conceptual questions which I think we need to answer in order to know more about if and how neighborhoods trap or help people move up the social ladder. And I think all, um, a lot of these um, questions or dimensions were also really present in your talk. So, um, first, yeah. <laughs> um, and in our own work, we're, we look mostly on the role of different kinds of neighborhood contexts for the arrival of refugees. And there we see, um, for example, that the regional economy or specifics of local housing markets play a huge role in the way refugees can access these labor and housing markets. And similarly, I think um, also similar to what you um, mentioned in your talk, uh, do pre-existing migrant networks or also strong migrant supportive civil society give access to much needed social support or if this lacks, um, this, uh, this is really felt um, by recent immigrants. And we also see what you mentioned that there is a shift going on that new immigrants rarely are able to settle in the neighborhoods that have been residential immigrant neighborhoods for decades and already have strong supportive infrastructure. In Germany specifically, this has a lot to do with national and regional policies that try to limit the residential mobility of refugees. So taking away a little bit of their strategic approach really to, to also um, um, spatial mobility and trying to fix them in, in certain areas. And this in combination with the rather expensive housing market um, directs migrants to peripheral neighborhoods outside of city centers at the outskirts in cities that, ha that have not been major immigrant destinations so far. And in our research, we look on refugee migration into East German high rise neighborhoods. And we can see that these areas are new, now new immigrant neighborhoods in the making. And um, these neighborhoods have, however, quite different characteristics than traditional immigrant neighborhoods. Um, as you already mentioned, traditional immigrant neighborhoods were often close to the city center, are neighborhoods with a high functional diversity with housing, shops, restaurants, civic organization. They offer many places for different activities, for the spreading of information, for meeting people. And, um, also including a lot of like a pre-existing migrant population that often offered useful connections for newcomers. And in contrast, we encounter that these high-rise neighborhoods we look at nowadays are often at the fringes of cities, are mostly residential neighborhoods with a lack of functional diversity and are sometimes or often located also in regions where prior migration is scarce or um, or the, the low level um, of prior migration consists of very different migrants in terms of language, country of origin. So there's a limited potential for new immigrants to connect to prior immigrants. And in our research project, we deal with the question in what ways such neighborhoods can nonetheless develop arrival functions or not. And I think in order to be able um, to say more about this, if living in these neighborhoods is a trap or a springboard for refugees, or it has not so much of an effect at all, I think it's worth paying attention to three aspects and then dimensions, yeah. <laughs> dimensions um, that matter in order to determine what's going on where and who can actually change something. Um, and the first uh, dimension or aspects I would like to um, talk about is scale. And I think um, because, uh, so this connects to questions which scale does matter uh, in the geographical variation of social mobility or access to resources. So questions like, is it the neighborhood, the city, the region, the regional state? 
and to um, to elaborate a little bit uh, in a research project in refugee reception in different neighborhoods, we encountered barriers to social mobility that were very local in their experience. So um, the refugees we talked to had a very local experience of these barriers, but um, that these were often produced by national or state regulations in the rather complex interactions with the local conditions. So this includes asylum regulations, accommodation systems, for example. And these are often things where the local level has some room to maneuver, but this room is limited and it's often not clear how decisive it is in order to change the situation substantially. And it's often also not really easy to say uh, which scale has a say over what. It's also sometimes really not clear from talking to local administrations. Um, so sometimes uh, it's really yeah, too difficult to get a grasp at, at these things. And also, and that, that's something we encountered in different aspects, is that even who has a say over what might vary in different localities. So interactions between different scales might, might be very different in, different neighborhoods or cities or regions. And connected to this, the second aspect I would like to um, talk about is, um, I think in order to investigate if a neighborhood is a mobility trap or a mobility enhancer, um, or if it's maybe not the neighborhood that matters so much, I think we furthermore need to know more about the respective mechanisms that produce social mobility. So I think you, you mentioned already some in your talk um, does the locality matter via local schools? Is it the regional labor market? Um, or is it uh, the formation of local social networks? How are these networks formed? Um, uh, and which of these mechanisms has more influence on social mobility outcomes or is more decisive? And um, this also relates to a question that we um, ask ourselves when we look on high -rise, East German high-rise neighborhoods is that um, are there, for example, well-known mechanisms um, or measures that could be substitutes for mechanisms which are already well-known in the literature on arrival cities? So I think we know from immigrant um, migration literature that um, immigrant networks or uh, migrant self-organizations are really important um, support mechanisms for newcomers. So in what ways are, for example, um, state-funded social work uh, organizations able to substitute functions um, like this? Um, or, or is this not substitutable? Um, so I think this is also an important question to ask if we look on new, newly forming um, neighborhood, neighborhoods. Um, and the third aspect, and I think you already also talked about this, is um, everyday mobility. And I think, so which part of the population does depend on local resources and who's able to access crucial resources elsewhere if <clears throat> these resources are not um, present in the locality. So for example, um, we encountered this in very different cities, for example, in Berlin, um, where we met a lot of refugees that simply go to central immigrant neighborhoods to do shopping, to access <coughs> support networks, or legal assistance, although they do not live there and sometimes do not even want to live there and say, I'm fine where I am, I just need to, I just need to transport link. That's something that's really important. And I think this also shows that in most cases, people are not really trapped in neighborhoods. People are always also mobile in their everyday activities. But I think, of course, the mobility differs. And I think we do not nearly know enough about everyday mobility and how people use areas or cities or yeah, neighborhoods which are not their residential neighborhoods. And I also think this potentially changes the question from how should we change neighborhoods to how close or how reachable in spatial terms need resources be located in order to enable social mobility. Um, and I think this, this lack of a reachable supportive structure can trap people, um, but it might not, it might be in some cases the residential neighborhood um, or for parts of the population, but I, I think not for everyone. And um, I think um, we still lack a lot of data to differentiate between different population groups, even in internal of my, um, between different immigrant population groups. Mm. And I think you mentioned already a lot of um, things that matter to this, the availability of public transport, how different cities work, how, how American cities or European cities work in this respect. Um, so yeah, I would like to stop here. Yeah, thank you. And thank you for the possibility to comment. And Matthias has some questions now. <laughs> well, thanks, Nihat. Um, Doug, would you like to react directly? My feeling is that Nihat added a lot of complexity to the matter mm -hmm. and mainly questioned the 
a perspective which majorly focuses on the neighborhood as such. Is that correct, right? So I mean, the floor is yours. Just choose your topic. Well, what I, I what, what I found what I find found particularly valuable in Nihad's work and and and, and in her discussion and and in and in her work is a focus on the very different experiences of refugee and asylum communities um, who engage with the neighborhood and the city in different ways, in large part not because of ambitions of their own, but because of the ways those forms of migration are handled, which is now when we talk about those phenomena, we're largely talking about Germany, Sweden, and to a lesser extent, some other Scandinavian countries. But, and we're really talking uh, a lot about the refugee wave that occurred after 2015 and 2015, 2016. Although this was the case, this was, this was a set of policies that existed before those years. In that in, in many countries, uh, refugee settlement is, is handled differently from classic economic immigration. It is handled top down by a state authority. Um, the location of settlement is chosen by the state authority and often uh, refugees are required to continue living there for some period of, of time uh, in order to continue receiving social assistance or until they've learned the language uh, or what have you. There are a lot, of, uh, a lot of different incentives in the case of Germany, of course, there was, there was a huge emergency in 2015, 2016. And I can't really fault national or state governments for the way they responded because it was an unprecedented level of people who had to be settled. But the settlement systems uh, were often based on, on, on deeming the best places for refugees to be settled as being places where housing was, uh, was, a, was available or empty or cheap. Um, there was deliberate policy not to settle refugees in, uh, in places where there were existing immigrants from those parts of the world. Um, um, it was deemed that we will not have any Syrians settled in, in Neukölln or, or Offenbach or places like that, um, which breaks up the traditional patterns of immigration where you seek out people from a similar background to aid you in settlement. But also meant that a lot of places that were very deprived and had semi-abandoned housing that had been semi-abandoned because there was no real economy going on around it, suddenly had large populations who, who were dumped in there um, and who have a relationship to the state that consists of almost 100% support because there's not, not much economy going on outside. So um, nevertheless, refugees generally either are seeking to return to the place they came from at some point soon, or they're seeking to become regular immigrants and then regular normalized uh, citizens. Um, nobody wants to remain a, a, a refugee. And it's interesting to follow the um, settlement patterns of people as they try to move out of this state designated uh, status into either uh, economic normalization and uh, some relationship with this set of communities around them or, 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 or to wait in, until they can seek, seek a return. Um, it's very different in other countries with lower rates of, of, of refugees among immigrants, where refugees are generally fairly quickly turned into regular Im economic immigrants and then into, uh, in, then into citizens uh, reasonably quickly. Uh, but it's, it's, a, it's, it's a case that has caused um, the cities of Eastern Germany to have a very different dynamic in terms of their neighborhoods. And as, as you mentioned, the different populations relate very differently. Um, and I think an important, another important thing out of your work is an emphasis not on the neighborhood, but on a complex relationship with the city. And you're right, I don't think there has been a good mapping of how people use various spaces in the city outside of just their uh, immediate neighborhood. Um, and you see this in the ethnoburg phenomenon in North America, where a lot of the classic immigration neighborhoods uh, have become sort of Potemkin villages. Um, the Chinatowns and Little Italy's of New York City or Toronto or, or, or Los Angeles um, uh, no longer have very many occupants at all. They've, they've made it into the lower rungs of the middle class and are living out in the outer suburbs, but maintaining the shops and restaurants and other businesses there or passing them on to other groups. The, 
the, uh, some of the Ch Chinatown districts in central Toronto are now mainly owned by Vietnamese uh, immigrants of a later generation uh, and so on. I, I live in, my house in Toronto is in the midst of a Korean uh, district where the Korean population I think is about 4%. Uh, uh, but still is culturally very Korean because the businesses they own, the buildings they bought uh, are still operated that way. So the, 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 the relationships between migration and, and urban geography is not just a matter of having a neighborhood. It's often, it's often a succession of neighborhoods. You do get populations who are dispersed, uh, who form these networks of mutual support virtually. Filipino communities in North America. Philippines is the largest source of immigrants to Canada. Um, and uh, yet there's no Filipino districts. There actually are, but they're, they're, they're not very well documented or, or, or very public, largely because the forms of employment are often based on domestic service and things like that. And it becomes a dispersed population who are able to form networks of support, not in a specific geography, but across uh, large geographies. Well, thank you. Um, I have a question coming in from Uwe Jens Walter, uh, who um, wants to know about the relationship of, of arrival versus sanctuary cities. Um, as many of you might know, uh, many cities have now embarked uh, on becoming sanctuary cities, meaning providing uh, a safe haven for refugees. And I think uh, Uwe's question is how much this political status and the reality of sanctuary cities matters for the definition and the reality of arrival cities. So is there an actual impact that you can observe, that you can find and see uh, between the two? Well, the sanctuary city movement is um, uh, uh, substantively is, is legislation within a, within a larger city to guarantee that there will not be legal persecution of, of, of people who are not of, um, uh, who are irregular immigrants or who are refugees who do not do not have a landed uh, status. Sometimes it includes giving the vote to non-citizen residents and so on also. Now, um, I can I created a lot of confusion by calling this type of neighborhood an arrival city because of course it, 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 it's, it's, it's a city within a city, uh, a network of connections formed by immigrants. Uh, uh, and, and not a city itself. An, an actual city can contain uh, hundreds of, of arrival city districts often overlapping in the same geographic space and so on. Um, these sort of laws are very important. Um, in that grid I showed the, 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 the importance of having not just legal, a pathway to legal citizen for, citizenship for residents, Although I would say this is also very important. It's one of the worst things that can happen to a city is to have a large population who do not have a pathway to legal citizenship, um, and particularly if they're, if they're you know, unaccompanied men or unaccompanied women without any family connections and so on. It, cre it, it creates a lack of investment in the city or lack of incentives to invest in the city. Um, but de facto, a pathway, uh, de facto citizenship can be as important and in some cases more important than, than actual legal citizenship. The ability to have the services of the city, uh, the ability to have medical care at uh, public clinics, the ability to have uh, uh, help in cases of abuse and things like that, to not have to live in hiding from authorities, um, but, to, but to see government authorities as, as sources of assistance when you're in trouble uh, is vitally important uh, for these families. The ability to live publicly without fear that immigration authorities are going to crack down on you. Certainly in the United States where there was a tradition that, uh, that police should not question the immigration status of people, that, 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 that immigration status was not part of policing, that broke down during the last 25 or 30 years or so, the, a big part of the sanctuary city movement is to recognize that that was a huge problem, that, that, that even, if, even if you believe that the, there should not be people, uh, so-called illegal immigrants in your city, uh, those sort of practices cause them to be even more illegal, cause people to live, to live underground. So uh, a legal regime in a city that recognizes people by residency rather than by citizenship, which is what the sanctuary city movement really is. It says, it says if you live here and therefore, 
that, that you are the, a resident and a voter and, and a taxpayer, rather than if you have a, a citizenship card. That can be very important in, 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 in causing uh, a better outcome for neighborhoods by, by allowing people who live there rather than are just citizens to invest in the futures of neighborhoods, to have, want to have a stake in their societies, in their schools, in, in the economy of their city and so on. So it's, it's worth replicating elsewhere as part of something that make, you could say the arrival city works better when it is a city of residents rather than just of, of those who've uh, achieved legal citizenship. And it allows cities not to be victimized by national policy, but to manage to function well, even if national policy doesn't totally make sense. Okay, uh, here's another comment actually on, po on the policy and planning side. Uh, one thing you mentioned is that transport infrastructures and investment in schools appear to be the two most, uh, two most important um, issues in, um, in turning places. Um, yet it seems that many uh, neighborhood policies are, um, are using participatory approaches and installing a neighborhood management, uh, do uh, public re relations working on the image, um, and there is especially in Anglophone countries a lot of policies focusing on getting more social mix, more mixed tenure. So I think that the comment was well, rather a comment than a question. So the question behind the comment, I think, is um, from your observations in so many countries across five continents. Uh, in reality, how do you really see the relation between uh, different kinds of policy approaches that are um, in reality used. Um, is there something of a, of a lesson uh, that could be directed to policymakers? Uh, I, sh I should stress that um, I, I didn't mean that schools and transportation are the most important uh, interventions, but they're the ones that are most, that are most manifested within the specific neighborhood. Um, uh, um, There's not a magic bullet uh, uh, policy uh, move. Um, I think I think community-driven ones are fine. I actually am not that cynical about rebrandings and 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 things like that. Um, I know these are popular along among a lot of municipal governments. It's a lot better when they do that than when they don't do that. I've seen a lot of neighborhoods. Um, I, I spent a bunch of time in Antwerp. I showed a picture of it. Antwerp is an interesting city because it's been governed by some really terrific uh, progressive minded mayors and it's been also been governed by some ultra nationalists and things like that. And it has a really thriving district of mainly Moroccan uh, origin called the 2060, which is located in an ideal location for a thriving neighborhood just right by the Diamond District, right by the Hauptbahnhof. And, um, and uh, uh, which the city had invested a lot of money in being sure that tourists never accidentally entered that neighborhood. Um, it has a great main street full of excellent fish restaurants and shops and that sort of thing that people of Moroccan origin could travel from across Europe to go there. And the city had spent a lot to make sure that nobody accidentally entered it and to keep people away from it and re redirect streets so that nobody accidentally wandered into it and anything. And, um, and smarter administrations later realized, okay, we could turn this into an attraction. We could say, please come to the interesting Moroccan district and eat at the great restaurants and, uh, and look at the interesting architecture and see a different life and that sort of thing. Um, and, uh, and those sort of campaigns can make a difference. A lot of what people are trying to do in neighborhoods is get middle-class people with money in their pockets to walk into their neighborhood and spend the money in, 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 the, in their neighborhood at their shop or their ice cream thing or their bar or what have you. Um, so let's not dismiss uh, rebranding campaigns. Sometimes putting a bunch of those fabric signs on the lampposts actually and, and you know, billboards in, in the subway can actually uh, make quite a difference. Um, <laughs> One of those fabric signs that I was just talking about nearly just fell on top of me. So uh, <laughs> uh, um, I'm, the, the rebranding campaign is getting its revenge on me. Um, uh, but yeah, do you have thoughts on this? Mm, yeah, I just, I just wanted, <coughs> I think, um, mm, 
rebranding campaigns and also the social mix policy have, I think, uh, also a lot of downsides, right? I mean, what do you think about the, um, there's always the danger that especially, or there are a lot of studies that show that uh, incoming middle class residents have a huge ability to um, somehow then enter this the policy discussion and um, redirect um, resources towards them so that there is somehow a split between um, lower income residents which then suddenly have uh, have more difficulties to organize for resources they would need because middle class residents are better able to access politicians to access services and also more vocal in what they need and what they want so uh, this can really be a downside and i think so this um there are especially in schools maybe there are ways where parents can connect and where there's might be also some resource transfers but i think there's also a lot of studies that shows that there's also a huge school segregation going on even if the district is not that segregated anymore so yeah i also wondered about your thoughts about this dynamic so you definitely don't want to have a situation where neighborhoods remain economically segregated. You do, you, you do want to have a middle class within, uh, within a neighborhood, or at least the ability for people within the neighborhood who are long, low incomes who achieve the ability to have the, some of the trappings of, of middle class uh, uh, to not have to leave their neighborhood. In necessarily in order to do it. Otherwise, you're left with what is essentially a stepping stone neighborhood at best. And the stepping home stone neighborhood model worked quite well for a long time. Um, in a rival city, I, I profile a neighborhood called Thorncliffe Park in Toronto, which is, which is a neighborhood of, of uh, about 30 very large apartment towers, all of which are private rental and not particularly inexpensive, um, that had been a destination community for people from uh, from Southern Europe and then from Eastern and Central Europe and, and now from the Indian subcontinent uh, and, and Syria now and so on. Um, that had been a place where people from migration backgrounds stayed for five to six years while they set themselves up, learned the language, got, saved up enough money to buy a house, which then they would do after five to six years. And in Canada, generally, immigrants back when immigrants were poor had about a 70% rate of purchasing houses within their first 10 years. They're higher rate than actual native born Canadians. This was similar in the United States, Britain, Belgium, countries where there's private ownership model of, of housing. But the, the, the global housing crisis, the global crisis of housing supply shortage has changed the dynamics of those stepping stone neighborhoods to the point that you can no longer just stay in a neighborhood for five or six years. Now, now immigrants stay in that particular neighborhood for 10 to 15 years uh, before they can save enough money. And the rate of immigrant housing purchases has fallen to something like 50% of immigrants within, within 10 years. And they're taking on usurious levels of debt often franchised across multiple branches of a family in order to get a house. Um, so stepping stone neighborhoods, and this is true also in, in, in mainly rental economy, uh, countries like Germany and, 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 and Switzerland and so on, uh, because the housing supply shortage affects rental housing as well. So the idea that you can just live somewhere and then move on to another place. Now, that can enhance neighborhoods. It means people are forced to stay where they are and make the best of it and invest in their neighborhood and achieve whatever upward mobility they can on the, at least the, in the initial steps within their neighborhood and maybe be more interested in influencing the housing corporations and so on to improving things in those neighborhoods. Uh, uh, but it means that there is an appetite for middle-class housing. So I think the important thing to recognize is that yes, you have problems when you create forms of middle-class housing within neighborhoods or you create, where you create a middle-class desirable school of, an ex, of, a, a, of gentrifiers moving in. But the image of the gentry as being these white people who are moving into a brown neighborhood and buying up the housing is complicated by the realities of it. Very often, the gentry are the people from that immigration background. They tend to have worldwide a higher rate of this upward social mobility than the established population. And if they're not, you need to ask the question, what's going on? So often the trajectories are, are missed. The fact that the 
the middle class people are seen as coming in, partly because there's a sort of J-turn migration happening within cities where people start out in this low income rental neighborhood from often from a migration background, their parents move them out to a slightly better rental neighborhood uh, when they're a bit older, then they grow up and they realize that their old rental neighborhood where they first settled is becoming more appealing that the old 19th century housing is suddenly is stopped being filthy and, and unpleasant and started to be cool and they buy up the apartments uh, in that neighborhood. My own, I mean, my own trajectory, family trajectory is that way on my wife's side of the family. Her, her grandparents were uh, dirt poor Italian peasants who settled in a very bad neighborhood uh, and then moved out into uh, a better neighborhood in her parents' generation. And now she and I have bought one of the houses in that terrible neighborhood uh, for a lot of money and, uh, and we've become the gentrifiers. So there is, there, there is complexity to this, but you want to build in, in incentives to it. And a lot of it has to do with not just plopping down uh, middle-class housing or suddenly upgrading housing to, uh, but it's, it's creating ways for people to participate uh, uh, in, 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 that, in that transition. Um, you also have to worry about cities like San Francisco and yes, Berlin, where you have a middle class who are being imported from, from elsewhere uh, into these neighborhoods. San Francisco is very interesting because while you have a middle class who are moving up from migration backgrounds and are often well established, you also have an international middle class who are being moved in in, in, in huge numbers who are not middle class. In fact, they are upper class. They're, if, you, if your salary has, has five zeros after it in the United States, it's, it's above 100,000, then, then you are not middle class. You are, you are, you are, uh, you are on a much higher level. And that, that, that changes the whole dynamic. And you certainly see that in places here. Um, but you all, but often these, often these things are, are missed because people from these immigrant backgrounds are participating in the gentrification themselves in quiet ways they've moved out. I mean, in Kreuzberg and Neukölln in Berlin, which are seen as places where poor Turkish immigrants uh, were being driven out by, by hipsters and, and, and wealthier white people, um, it's very often that the buildings were bought during the 70s and 80s by the Turkish families who were living there. The, the people who owned the little kebab shop downstairs did the very Turkish thing and actually bought the, the, the building because there's a real uh, desire to own property. Um, and, and often that rise in property values is being participated in by the initial immigrant communities. So I would say, we, yes, we need to be careful that a neighborhood is not just overtaken, but the, often the way to do that is to ensure the participation of the original, uh, the original residents of the neighborhood in, in that gentrification to allow us all to become the gentry all right. Um, I think we have still room for one or two questions. And one question which just comes in um, is about uh, the citizenship issue. Um, Doug, you mentioned the importance of pathways uh, to full legal citizenship, both for um, bringing up the neighborhood, but also for the situation of immigrants as such. Um, the question here is whether the neighborhood, whether this relation also work, works vice versa, meaning that the neighborhood can provide resources uh, for um, achieving path for, for entering these pathways to full citizenship or for more political participation. And I think Nihad, that's an issue which is also due to you, maybe. I would pass that to Nihad first <laughs> because you've actually written papers on exactly this question. Yes. Okay. <laughs> So first, More or less. Yeah, and um, right. yeah, so yeah, it, it depends a little bit how the question is meant. I think um, achieving legal citizenship, yeah, in connection to a lot of factors that, or such as social mobility that um, are connected to, uh, to, getting, um, to getting naturalized, I think, yes. But especially, um, I think, um, inner city neighborhoods, for example, if we think about political participation, um, uh, there I think there are especially um, multicultural, multifunctional neighborhoods that offer a lot of ways that to to spread information to um, 
places for political recruitment, for example, where people actually get activated um, to, to get politically um, active, just in simple terms, to, to sign petitions or to partake in demonstrations. And I think this, this, uh, this, this varies regionally, and um, I did some research that shows that. So I think there, there are um, and th that these mechanisms of information distribution, etc., also apply to, to other kinds of um, um, yeah, citizenship dimensions, which are dependent on similar structures. Um, yeah. Yeah, I would put that similarly by saying um, there's a big change in the way governments, whether local or national, view uh, a neighborhood of immigration uh, when the residents of that neighborhood get the vote. Um, when they, when, when they, they stop being a, a social problem to be dealt with on behalf of white voters and start being not only potential voting blocks for their party, but also potential members of their party. And we saw big shifts, for example, here in Germany, when uh, uh, finally after 40 years, when Germans of Turkish descent um, got the right to citizenship after 1999, um, you saw a slowly dawning awareness that they were a voting bloc that I think culminated in the CDU's uh, promises in, during the last decade to allow dual citizenship, um, which, was, which was internally within the party a desire to have Germans of Turkish descent become CDU voters in certain areas to win back those areas. We saw Britain's conservatives before they were taken over by extreme nationalists uh, uh, make a big effort to become, try to become the, a, a party of racial and ethnic diversity to try to get away from the idea that, that white people voted for them and play down the racists within the party. To try to Canada's conservative party did that during the 2000s as well to say, to try to become a, a right-wing party of, of diversity. Uh, and in fact succeeded in the 2011 election when they, they, for the first time in history, attracted more racial minority votes than the Liberal Party. Uh, they then managed to blow that all up with a, with a somewhat xenophobic campaign four years later. But, uh, 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 but certainly it's much better to have conservative parties uh, trying to become parties of diversity to attract people from these neighborhoods uh, rather than parties of intolerance that are, that are, that are viewing them as, as problems. So there's a lot of benefits that come from pathways to legal citizenship, including for conservative parties. Okay. Um, I think we have four minutes to go. So uh, here's the last question and maybe you can provide a very concise and short answer to it. Um, in your talk, you said that what makes a neighborhood an arrival place is what it actually can make it fail later on in the next generation. And it's, uh, this sounds like a, like a tragedy um, and also like some kind of automatism. So is it an automatism? That's the question. And uh, if not, what are the maybe two or three most important points that can stop this automatism? What prevents this from being some time bomb, really, um, is the fact that the people who live in an urban district or in a, or in a town or, or in a specific geography, they know about these problems. Um, people know why a neighborhood has lower rent or housing costs than other neighborhoods. Sometimes it's just because it has a bad reputation or it's because it's always been a place where people who are racially discriminated against are relegated or, 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 or forced to live. Sometimes it's because it's, uh, it has physical problems. It's located on the edge of a super highway or beside an airport or a dump or a chemical factory or something like that. Um, uh, sometimes it's because it takes 45 minutes on a bad bus connection to get to the neighborhood. Uh, or something like that. Sometimes it's because it's all just a bunch of apartment housing uh, with fields around it and, and not, no way to have an economy going on with it without difficult connections uh, to other places. Sometimes it's because the housing is very poor and, and just very cheap and that sort of thing. Everybody living there knows that. 
everybody, a large proportion of people in any neighborhood are thinking about what they could do if they managed to save a little bit of money to improve their status. And if you ask them, they will tell you, and often that is a much cheaper intervention to ask them mm. what, it, what is it that caused the rent to be low? What is, it that, that, what is it that's preventing you from doing this next step in your life within your neighborhood? Often that simply means replacing that 45 minute bus route with, uh, with, a, with a better tram connection or something like that. Doing, that may cost tens or even hundreds of millions, but it's much cheaper uh, to do that once than to have uh, hundreds of millions of social service costs and welfare costs and policing costs over the next three or four generations because this problem sits unsolved. So I would argue that a, a one-time intervention that the residents know about is a much better deal for governments than, than treating this as a baked in social problem that has to be dealt with for the rest of time. Well, that's a next to perfect best practice recommendation at the end of uh, our talk. Uh, thanks, Doug, for that. And thank Nihat and Doug uh, for this great talk. Thank you. Both. And uh, thank you all for participating and asking your questions. Yes, thank you, everybody. Um, we hope to see you again, uh, either physically in ACNA or online at one of our international lectures. And last but not least, great thanks to Sarah Brechmann, who was responsible for, organize, for doing the technical organization and who made that possible. And um, a very nice afternoon to all of you. Um, goodbye. Goodbye, everybody. Thank you.